Welcome to Seeking Heaven, the Near-Death Experience and Other Phenomena. I am your host, Tamara Calder Richardson. I'm also a six-time near-death experiencer and an evidential psychic medium. Thank you for joining us today, and we have a very special guest for you. And I am so excited to, to bring this person to you. And our guest is a near-death experiencer, just released his book, Life After Breath, How a Brush with Vitality Informed Me of Immortality. And he is also a psychotherapist, a Reiki healer, and a past life regression therapist. He also holds a Master of Social Work. He's a licensed clinical social worker. And there's so many things that he's done. There's so many things that I want to talk to you about. Let me go ahead and bring on our guest. And that would be Jacob Cooper. Welcome, Jacob, for finally being on the show. An honor. Thank you for having me on your program, <laughs> Seeking Heaven Tomorrow. It's, it's an honor to be here. Awesome. Well, look, I know you've got this book. Before we go any further, tell us how the book came about, and then we'll dive a little bit into your near-death experience. And then I want to talk about you as the person and how that has affected you and kind of who you are now. I want people to get to know you because I know you've done a few of these interviews by now. So um, tell us a little bit about the book and how that happened. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, I like to say the book really was kind of like mana from heaven. It didn't come from me. It came from a higher dimension. And um, why I say that is I was always a struggling writer, and I speak about this within my book. And writing was never my forte. I never envisioned this to be my forte. But ultimately, the biggest incentive was to give back um, something that I was provided to throughout my life in any dark moment of the soul that I had, I would pick up, you know, an inspiring book, whether that be a Tony Robbins book or mm -hmm. Sylvia Brown in her day or, you know, any of those. <laughs> I've read that too, yeah. And um, to me, that would just uplift anything that I was going to, you know, going through. And during these times, I wanted to give back that to other people. And there's something just totally different that you could give through a book that you might not be able to give in a workshop or an individual session. And I wanted to give people something different. You know, it's absolutely true. You know, I'm, my book is almost done. Uh, there's a couple things that I still need to kind of work through before I write it. I'm not kidding. Uh, wait, maybe you can help me. Uh, and, uh, but, but seriously, it is, I, I did not realize that the process of writing, I did the book proposal and all that, and it's, you know, is that um, because I'm a creative person, uh, I used to own an advertising agency, I think I told you that, that this is another form of creativity, but I noticed that writing, you can, t you, you use words that are more elaborate than you would use in life, so people can get a deeper sense of who you are, and it's a different way of communicating. So it is, it is to me, it's rewarding. I didn't realize how writing can be, uh, it, it's so intimate, don't you think? Yes, and you know, I'm going to be doing a writing workshop, you know, for aspiring authors on owning their inspired oh. stories. When is that going to happen? Few months on, on a face, I'm going to be doing a Facebook Live. Perfect. But what I find is it's just amazing when you sit and take time out of your day and put a pen to the paper or fingers to the keypad, you know, on your, on your computer and what could come out. Um, and so I, I just find is you put yourself out there, you organize a couple of minutes to an hour once a week, what that could build up to. And, you know, my book is 200 pages, but, and, and plus with other stuff, but it didn't happen in one sitting. And yeah. so I think if people incrementally have an idea, have an umbrella of it, and, yeah. you know, kind of just allow themselves to go with the flow, um, it's just amazing what could happen. It's not all that rocket science-y, you know. I think it's it's feasible. Rocket scientist-y. <laughs> yeah, I, I love how you made that word up. That's good. Yeah, it's, it's feasible with determination, consistency, and a passion for getting your message out there in, in these times, you know, so. No, absolutely. Um, I took that, uh, the Hay House Writers Workshop thing, and one of the things they said is have an idea where you want to end up. Sure. But what I've noticed, so I did all of that, wrote the whole thing. They said you should never have more than 12 chapters. Eh, it's, I think you do whatever you want to do. Uh, but, uh, you know, tell that to, what is it, to, uh, you know, to other authors. But but when writing the book, I noticed that it, it even though you had a beginning, you know, the beginning and the end and the middle, 
that it morphed and it changed as I was writing the book. Did it do that for you? Yes, you know, I think the book goes through many different carnations. Um, you know, it's not like you just sit there and then one time it's done. And so you have your version. And then I think the important part is finding a, a wonderful editor. I know Dr. Wayne Dyer would stress that excessively. Yeah. Anyone who would come up to him with people that I know close, you know, that work closely with Wayne, ed having a good editor mm -hmm. is important. And not just a good editor, but a, an editor who shares and understands your vision. Absolutely. And will allow your creativity to come out. And I was very lucky to to have that, you know, with, with my editor. You're and, very lucky. I've yeah, heard of nightmares, yeah. so that's great. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and finding something that sits right with your gut. I had a lot of authors, mm -hmm. a lot of, not authors, but offers uh, yeah. for an, an exuberant amount of money that just, it, it just didn't make sense. And if you could pay that, God bless. But, you know, there's ethical editors out there who really want to help you, who, you know, are fair with their work and their exchange. And uh, there's certainly those out there. So well, I, I think that what you're, what you're doing to get, to help people, especially the people that have a, a, a very soulful story that they want to tell, whatever that may be, you know, spiritually transformative, near death, whatever it may be. Um, it could be some kind of spiritual manifestation, who knows, that if they want to get it in a writing form, so many people are intimidated by that. And once out there, of course, with self-publishing, you can always do that. But you're right, there is that big lump of cash in the beginning. But then again, don't you want to own your work? Yes, you know, um, but, you know, never, never sell yourself short. I, as a first-time author at 30 years old, I should be without a New York Times bestseller endorsing me. I should be self-published. You know, that's what people would tell me. Uh, but I put myself out there. I put myself to almost every yeah, publishing company and every endorsement. And I feel blessed from those in the heavens because this wasn't on me. But I was able to get, uh, you know, the great Anita Marjani to endorse my book and Dr. That's Rudy awesome. Moody on my cover and uh, Suzanne Giesenman and Dr. Yvonne yeah. Kaysen and a couple yeah. other people. She was that, just you, on, yes, on the yeah, channel. The, the, the point that I'm trying to make is, uh, you know, without sounding self-aggrandizing, is that when you put your head down and you just have passion, it's just amazing you're what right. hard work could could do that talent alone could not. I'll leave. No, it you're absolutely right. Well, it was. It's. Oh, uh, well, so tell us about the book. Now, did you? Now, is it about your life? Is it just about the near-death experience? Is it about? Tell us a little bit overview without giving it away, because we want to get people to purchase sure. that, and then we want to go into a little bit of your story, a little, uh, not just in the book, but um, what happened. So if you could see the book with yep. you know, some of the lighting uh, might be the issue. Yeah, Life I see it. And you see Dr. Emma Moody. It has angels in a ladder um, there. And so for me, you know, this part of the, you know, first, you know, portion of the book talks about my near-death experience that I had as an infant. Um, and, you know, that's one part of it is talking about that experience. Uh, but, but the other part that I try to emphasize is to not be defined by the story, but to define the story. Uh, and so, bam. Okay. That's one know, of the remember nuggets. Say yeah. that again. That's a good nugget. That's a good you wisdom know, nugget. So, you know, I'll, you know, to not be defined by the story, but rather to define the story. I love yeah. it. So, I love it. You know, with respect, I, I do see a lot of, you know, people, they'll time and time again tell their story, and that's important. But I sure. think the more important part is most, you know, f probably 5 to 10% of the population have had near death experiences. And the vast majority of people have not. And so the reason why I decided to talk about how I was able to integrate it. It was not for a vendetta purpose. It was not for a journal purpose or for catharsis, although it, it did have that effect, but rather to create universality and a bit of an ownership for people to formulate engagement and understanding of their own spirituality and divinity through the grounded elements of the book and when I got very you know, personal. So there, there's this memoir-based component, uh, but... I, I try not to categorize it because I think there's something for everyone that they okay. could find within the book. But it, it's, um, 
it's a story that I think has universality in a sense that I had this experience, I tried burying it for a while and tried to fit in, and then ultimately that beach ball cannot stay under the water for a bit of time. Mm -hmm. It eventually had to come up, and I think for all of us, you know, we tried to kind of ignore our eternity, a part of ourselves to try to fit in, and the world did that to us. But I think we're learning more how to express who we are, rather what we've been programmed and taught. I hope so. I certainly hope so. And that was one of the questions. Let's go ahead. That's, um, and of course, it's ready. They can purchase the book, and we'll go back to it, and there'll be the links underneath on Amazon as well, correct? Yes. You know, it's, it's, it's available through paperback on Amazon, Kindle. I'm getting my own voice recorded, oh, which good. is actually a big fear of mine. Um, I don't know about you, but I have a very difficult time seeing myself in a video mm -hmm. and hearing myself, and that's something that I'm yeah. personally trying to work on. You know, a lot but of it's it your story, you know, you need to yeah. own it. Yeah, but um, yeah. I I think that's a good idea because I think readers want to hear the voice of the author. They want to take that home with them rather than some third party, you know, kind yeah, of more personalized, you know, for readers. And, I do. Yeah. You know, what you're, all of this is being brave. I mean, people don't realize this. I mean, you're, you stepping out, then other people can step out, but it is, even like you're saying, the voice. A lot of people don't like the way they talk. But I'm like, hey, be glad you got a voice right now, you know, and our voice is not just uh, vocal cords, but we are creating uh, manifestations as we speak. And so um, you're speaking so much out just by the things that you're saying right here. Now, I wanted to go into because, you know, I, mine, I had a prenatal, but my first one I really remember was three also. And yours was three. Um, and it's funny because I want people to understand that are watching this. It's like. Uh, how did it come up for you? Because for me, I did bury it to like, mm -hmm. and, 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 and what do you, you know, and it's also unusual. We're, we're, what do you do with that? And it does come up. So talk about how it came up for you. Not that everybody's the same. They're not. Um, and, and like, how did it start coming out? Yeah. You know, I speak about this in the book that very early on in life, you know, and we'll get a little bit more into details of the experience, mm -hmm. but having that, you know, I was very much an open conduit between this world and the other world. And I was a lot more comfortable, actually, in that world than this world. And Hello. You know, <laughs> I, I get it. <laughs> I had to live, learn how to live between the two worlds. And at times, I was just really in this 9 to 5, going to the supermarket, going to the school world. But... Oh, um, Okay, yes. can I stop you right there? Okay, okay. I knew you were my brother from the light. Okay, so, um, okay, cool. So when you were in school, this is this is this is a trip. So when you were in school and you were in that desk and you were in that room or whatever it was, did you daydream about the other side? Because I did. All the I, time, and I write about this too. quite yeah. you know, quite a bit within my book. Um, part of it was. I knew what I experienced was quite euphoric and otherworldly, but some part of me still had some hope that people weren't as blinded or as forgetful or as amnesiac of that world. And so there was one moment, and I speak about this in the book, and I remember this very clearly. I remember very little of my infancy and childhood other than these profound <laughs> the yeah, the other stuff moment, didn't really matter. <laughs> uh, of, of the other realm, and right. this one was a little bit more boring. But every time I connected to that realm, it's really stuck, you know, because that you're connecting to eternity. You know, mm, it's absolutely. always there. There's no beginning, middle, end. It's, it's there. It's non-linear like this, this body and this brain. But there was one moment when I was in preschool where I just was able to kind of read and look at different animal totems and spiritual beings around a person. And I I looked at my classmate and I said, do you see these things? And, you know, I got a Dwayne Johnson, the people's eyebrow kind of look. And after that, I kind of knew that, okay, you know. Keep it to I, yourself. And that how, was How old were you, first grade? My experience, you know, this, this was in preschool. And okay. I do interviews to this day, and there's an immense amount, I had this myself, of skepticism and stigmatization about, you know, how this was able to be remembered. And 
you know, we'll talk a lot of, a little bit about this in a bit, but but part mm -hmm. of my drive behind the work that I do, uh, particularly in the work of past life regression, is to take away some of the limitations that we have with association of this physical body and all that there is. And I think we yeah. can not only remember previous lifetimes, but within the subconscious, there's everything that, that we that could be access to. And the more open that we are, right. the more that we'll able to, able to integrate a lot more of our stories so that we could write a more defined one. Well, one of the things that we had talked about before uh, pre-show was that um, I myself uh, had it come out, my near-death experiences in strips, and I would see certain things. And I had a uh, regression and it, and it was so much, I had pages of, I mean, I knew what was on the TV, what was happening, the temperature, everything. And, uh, and to the point that I actually went past life, I've done like 300 hours of, of past life in between life. And it's a lot more accessible than you realize, especially mm -hmm. if you're in someone's hands that know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I, I highly, now some people go, Oh, well do it yourself through meditation. It's up to the individual. But I personally, I said, I want this out. I know it's there. It's coming out in the pieces. I want to knock this thing out. And I really like the regression. So I, I promote that. So uh, hopefully you'll get some business from this from people that, are seeing flashes of their childhood and they can't quite put it together, especially when you're talking about an altered reality, an altered, a, a different place, or what is this? And and I think that that can really help put it all together in a in a safe environment. No, I, absolutely. And I think the biggest question that people have is why am I here? And what's my life's purpose? And so I think so many people live out their life's purpose from their personality and their ego in this linear construct that they have of what they've been taught, but they don't live out their soul's purpose, their soul's purpose in this lifetime, which comes from such a deeper vantage point than what we've been taught and the limitations of the linear mind. And I think path side regression will really allow people to kind of reset how they see themselves and to get more into the groove of the soul of where they're meant to be and go um, and the current that they could create in this lifetime. Right, absolutely. You know, it's sad to me, This there are so many people that, especially pre-COVID, uh, were, were doing things that they weren't happy with or or are married to people they didn't like. <laughs> Hope I don't get anyone upset. But now is a time we've had so much time to reflect and sit back and go, what do I like? What do I not like? If I, do, you know, and, and it's sort of like a, a, a birth pains, you know, for, for the whole world because we're, we're spiritually waking up. And I think that's positive. So people can be on the track of why they came here because everybody definitely has a purpose. Mm -hmm. So going back to now, when you were three, let's just go back a little bit, kind of what you, what happened Do you, did you recall it? Did it come out in pieces? How did it come out for you? Did you get regression? How did it happen for you? Yeah. Now I, I remembered it crystal clear, you know, at three and when I was experiencing it, um, it was a thin veil right in front of me, you know, directly in front of me, much like I'm looking at you, um, quite Am a thin up. veil. <laughs> angelic and spiritual guide esque but um you know it was it was right you know people think of heaven and the other side as this place far away and you know i speak about this a little bit in my book but there's many di different dimensions it's right here it's right here it's a lot closer yeah it, we just can't see it it's right here it's right in, it's right here yeah. overlaying it's just a tick above you know universe. that's exactly right that's why mediumship we can connect so quickly because they're actually right here, but we can't see that layer. It's a very thin veil, and I speak, and that's why I have mm -hmm. angels on the covers. I really connect to an infinite sea of angels that were actually brown and gold kind of color, and they were cherubim, like childlike angels, and they're floating very peacefully in front of my body. But I remembered the experience. Um, on an ever inner level, it never left me. It was always there, oh, yeah. sometimes closer, sometimes a little yeah. bit further away, but that. it was always on some radar present. So tell tell yeah. the tell the people listening just a little bit. I know you've done several interviews, but just an overview, kind of what happened. 
Oh, so they have an idea about your NDE. Mm-hmm. They're going to have to buy the book to, you know, hear it all. But yeah, so some of the over, you know, overview was I was three years old, as we said before. It was 1993. We were just getting ready before the Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur, which is a day of atonement for the soul to really have a year of health and to get ready in front of the Creator and to clean all of the sins and misdeeds so that we could live another life. And so that was one interpretation of the time. I had a different experience around that time of a different form of of the Creator that wasn't (laughs) as human-based or kind of conditional based off of this reality. Uh, But I had a bacterial, not bacterial, I had an upper respiratory infection called pertussis, Mm -hmm. or generically known as whipping cough. And whipping cough, if you're familiar with that, you know, treatment could be quite fatal to infants. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I went to a park with family friends and I I suffocated uh, due to the whipping cough. I literally was not able to breathe. Um, you know, and after that, you know, everything in my body shut down and due to deprivation of oxygen, the last part that I was holding on to was my brain. And that literally felt like I had a plug pulled in my brain and it just yanked and just, you know, snapped in half, mm. you know, kind of thing. Almost like you take, you know, plug in a wall and just yank it out. And yeah, then yeah. once that happened, so, everything yeah. else opened. Okay, so okay, so here here you are, a little teeny baby body, three years old, right. and did you did you did you, could you comprehend what was happening? Absolutely, you um, still knew the, the the the. I look at it no differently than I look at today. I think within this lifetime, there's an external presentation that we have to the world, and you know sometimes with our environment and our family and our culture you know, that kind of changes, but there's a part beyond the surface of the water that's eternal. And, you know, that is the soul, which is not from the body. It's it's eternal. And I call that the, yeah, sacred, yeah. the sacred observer that's always there. And, and so how we present that to the world, you know, once the personality and the body and the soul and the body, you know, kind of connect with each other, you know, that kind of comes in harmony. So the pitch of who we are is able to be portrayed to the world. But from a very early age, that inner deepened part of us is is there on a level. And then, you know, the personality comes out of that and the emotional part to the world comes out of that. But beyond that, you know, through infancy, there's always that sacred observer that's 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 eternal. Well, well it's the base core of who you are. And I think that kind of ties back to what you were saying earlier about that people getting back to their purpose or whatever it is, is that they, uh, underneath all that, they've got to find themselves, which is that core person. Like you said, you were that core person mm-hmm. and you're still that core person. And, you know, we're all still that little kid. We're still the grown up. We're still, we're, 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 we're it's, still, it's, it's all. Yeah. It's all but of I, it. I think, you know, and, you know, infancy before we, I would say before this body, you were after this body, you will be, you know, you, you're just this eternal wave. And so, you know, I experience myself no differently than I feel today, except my body's a little bit different. The world outside of me is different, but the world inside of me, that's always there. And that inner observer is always there. It's not defined by uh, physical age and development. You know, that could help evolve that inner being, but that that part of us it's it's always sacred and always divine i think within every lifetime we chip away at that you know to kind of yeah. enhance the masterpiece yeah. a little bit within so yeah I, I would love that actually that little area there uh if you would join us we'll find out with your schedule the live chat then you that would be neat to go into chipping away from the past life regression because i i i have experience on that too and it does because it's 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 almost so uh, overwhelming to realize that we truly, truly are eternal spiritual beings. So right. until, you know, until someone has like an out-of-body experience or something where they're, oh, I'm looking at myself on the bed. And I think this is a lot more common, not just near-death experience, but that too, uh, but other experiences. So, okay, so you're a little kid. Did you pop out of your body? What happened after that? So how did you my, experience my that? My body, like um, I was climbing a ladder to a slide and 
at the end of the ladder, I, I suffocated, you know, literally my spiritual guides pushed me down the slide and my body was, you know, flatlined. And so my body was there and I was able to see a form of myself and feel a form, you okay. know, of myself looking on the side of my body. So okay. I was aware of kind of like the soul body that I had. And right, my looking at body, the body body. Right. Yeah, kind of me like, too. You know, yeah, I got it. Body, you know, so I was still aware of a form that I had. Um, Where was your parents? So my parents were not there with me in the park on that day. I was actually with, you know, a, my babysitter who who would watch me, um, mm -hmm. and and she was kind of like my godmother at the time. Um, her name is Rhonda, and sometimes to this day I call her "Help Me Rhonda," like the Beach Boys mm -hmm. song, because she, <laughs> you know, and her husband literally saved my life, you know, at a, at a young age. But uh, it, so the hardest part was when you're suffocating you're aware of everything around you, but people can't see you or hear you. You yeah. see your body lifeless and you're like, that's not me. I'm, so I was on the it side was, right, and right. I just wanted to grab people and I was non-responsive. So you're that was, right. that was very frustrating. Yeah. Like why can't they hear me? So what right. happened to that rush over there? Who saw you? Did the other children? I mean, what happened? Because you couldn't really help yourself. I was with, I was with their kids and, you know, a sibling of mine, and I was non-responsive and I heard them calling my name and I wanted to engage back, you know, and scream out, but I couldn't be heard. And, you know, so eventually they had to call the ambulance, um, you know, and back, I was really kind of seeing myself a bit on the ambulance, but I was more, and I talk about this in the book, more in the other realm, you know, you know, I, I firmly believed in my experience. It's wrong when you say that. Every time you say the other realm, you start smiling. Every time I was in the, every time you say the other realm, you smile really big. Cause I know. <laughs> I know. It, Do you miss when, it? When it's true, it's very hard to not brighten up. I actually speak about this a lot where a lot of people get so serious with this stuff. And I oh. think really, um, let's I bring up the beach boys a lot, but they had a song called good vibrations. Right. And so yeah. I think part of, what I experienced was myself as a really just an energetic vibration and laughter, smiling, that really enhances your light and you're able to, to really access higher realms that way. Not this kind of stoicism, very tight, right. very serious kind of portrayal that people have. It's not so serious. It's very easy, very free, very light. You know, it's like a gentle tap on your shoulder that you feel. It's very gentle. Um, you know, that's, that's the way that I connect to the other realm. So, well, you know, it's funny that so many people, you know, they get you, you work early on so hard to, you know, have accomplishments and, you know, make a living, make a living for your family, whatever it is. And then you get so busy into the whole cycle of things that sometimes we forget to have fun and we begin to take ourselves a little too seriously and, you know, through laughter, our heart opens up and we begin to heal. Now, like what you said about early on, you said you were talking about your name, Jacob, and you're talking about the ladder. And I want to tell us about the significance of that, the spiritual significance, and then also about heart. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, you know, um, Jacob, you know, and there's different interpretations of, of the Old Testament and Genesis depending if you are the, you know, Islamic faith or the Jewish faith, but at least from you know, the angle that I grew up in, in that interpretation of Genesis, you know, Jacob was fleeing from his, for his life from his brother Esau, you know, and a lot of this had to do with, you know, the covenant from, from Isaac, the father, but essentially Jacob was fleeing from his brother and he decided to take a, a, a you know, he decided to go to sleep and he kind of put like, um, he decided to make a bed of rocks around him, and he had a dream of angels going up and down the ladder. Um, and the spot of where his dream, they say, is in a it is in a place called Bethel, or Bethel, or the house of God. And so, within my near death experience, it's just ironic that I have the same name as Jacob. I go on a ladder, yeah. I have this kind of experience, and I really connect to the house of. God that I speak a little bit about in my book. So there's a lot of symmetry and allegorical references of biblical Jacob, you know, to what I experienced in my name. And my middle name is is Hart in Hebrew or, or Lab or, or 
you know, lave, as you would call it. And I was named after my grandmother, um, who passed away, you know, two months before I was born. And oh. part of it was taking on her legacy of coming from the heart. And the heart is very important. I always speak about this in my work. Um, the most important connection that we could have is a couple inches apart. It's our mind and our heart. And, and yeah. finding really good connectivity between the two is important. So Well, especially with the work that you do, I mean, it's really, isn't it? it's very heartfelt. I mean, cause you're doing therapy with people and those are, don't you think that being a psychotherapist working with people that uh, had say trauma and you know, mm -hmm. definitely a lot of near death experiencers have had some kind of trauma, some more than others uh, or some kind of pain or abuse or whatever. It's, it seems to be uh, the case of more than not that going through this uh, is it, it can make your body sick if you don't get rid of it. I mean, cause it is it's so connected to our heart and our soul. Uh, don't you feel like that it does help to uh, release some of this? Unquestionably. So I think a lot of people try to be Mr. Atlas and that's what we're taught. <laughs> where we have to do this all alone and we have to be stoic and we have to hold it in. But, I, I, I couldn't disagree more. I think the more that you're able to understand the tangibility of the inner part of our being, no differently than you would managing the garbage in your own home or the Listerine that you put on the morning or toothbrush, the more that you'll have an understanding of, okay, there's a lot that's weighing on me right now. Mm -hmm. If I don't take care of this, it's not going anywhere. It's just going to build and build, and eventually it's going to lead into into – a crisis and so I think being very proactive versus reactive helps but also that awareness of the inner part of ourselves that's not tangible or physical to a lot of people um, is very pivotal and that's what I try to enhance with my clientele um, is, is yeah. that awareness. Yeah tell us a little bit about because you know the book is also going to be very healing every time someone hears uh, especially uh, you know a near-death experience story or something you know hopefully it touches their heart on some level in some way or at least gets people thinking about you know this life that we have and how we can improve upon it tell us a little bit because i'm curious myself about your work and how do you feel like you best help people because they can certainly we'll have your information below they can certainly connect with you because i know that you're all about service and helping so tell us a little about about the work that you do and you how you feel like it can help people mm -hmm. you know all of my work comes out of the greatest school of my near-death experience. Every thought, every deed, every action is based in that other realm. And why I say that is I use the other side as my ultimate classroom and framework for the impetus and drive that I have in this lifetime. And my goal in some capacity is to really reframe the framework of the classroom. I think so many people have lived their life based on the classroom that they walked into and that's important too to integrate but this classroom is not reflective of our true nature as an eternal being of love as an eternal being with yeah. the purpose as a spiritual being and so what i try to find is for people to not put their value in everything in myself but to really take that power back and so there's many different levels of that, but instead of telling someone something, my goal is to get people to ask questions. My goal is for people to experience this through their own selves. And so through hypnotherapy, mindfulness, past life regression, you know, psychotherapy, you know, all these different modalities, my goal is for people to tap into that masterpiece within with their own Ex direct experience and level. So let me ask you this, Jacob. Say so someone would come to you. I'm, I'm curious. They would come to you and, you know, everybody's different. You know, I have clients are all different. So they would come to you and they say, hey, um, you know, I, I keep having nightmares and sometimes I see visions of I think I might have had an experience. My parents didn't tell me about it. Let's just say we're making this up. And I need some help with that because I feel like it's spilling over in my life and I really don't know what it is. What do you recommend? What services of yours to get? How would that work? Well, if that was a client that came to me, the first step that I would do is validate that client. It's right. very easy to push things away. Most people, 
are taught to do that. There's a lot of stigmatizations in many cultures mm -hmm. of, ex of self-expression yeah. and asking for guidance and asking for support. So first things first, that's, that's, a, that's a very strong client. Yeah. The second step is I would try to do an intake with the client because there's a lot of different modalities that we could work with. Ultimately, again, the framework that I try to utilize is my near-death experience. That's everything that I try to have in my life. And so I had this experience. I had this NDE. The healing came from having a diagnosis of my experience that I had later in life from reading mm -hmm. Betty 80's Embraced by the yeah, Light. Yeah. In, she was in on my, here too in December. Yeah, she's you know, Betty's, awesome. Betty's a friend of mine, and I tell I told her about myself. I know she actually has a family member with my name too, but um, yeah, Betty Betty's wonderful. Yeah, and that to me was very woman. yeah that to me is very cathartic because you know there's a lot of frenzy and concern, and we're kind of on this worry kind of thing. It could be very overwhelming. Once mm -hmm. we're able to have tangibility of oh this is what I'm experiencing, it's under this umbrella, that becomes a, an easier pathway for people to start getting the ball rolling. So, you know, for people who come to me, you know, let's just say they're going through, they're saying, I have no motivation, I am losing interest in activities, I'm not sleeping, you know what I could say to them, that sounds a bit like a depressive episode. We want to rule out, obviously, mm -hmm. biochemical stuff where you might want to contact your primary care doctor. But right. you know, having a possibility of that, that, that mental health is very real, it's not something to be ashamed of, is, is quite cathartic. And you know, the next part I would say is developing um, an organization of language past just the kind of thought energy that people are ruminating about and being able to really organize it and develop an emotional vocabulary mm. behind, you know, being just being very overwhelmed, not knowing where to start to begin. I so. got it. So basically, and that's kind of what uh, also uh, Dr. Von Kaysen, uh, which also uh, wrote a, a uh, something on your book. It, I think endorsed I, me. Yeah, it endorsed me. Yeah, endorsed you. Um, and so. Uh, that uh that validation of like where she came up with the spiritually transformative experience ste and to validate okay i think what you're having here is this you know it could be oh someone died and i saw them at the foot of my bed you know maybe that you know i think you're having you know you, of course you you know you you would you would know uh what the different categories and that might just give someone some peace of mind just knowing they're not going crazy if in fact they had a real you know, experience. So, uh, mm -hmm. and then if they did want to work through like a past life or a, a, a near death thing that was popping up, that's something that you could also take them into regression, right? Absolutely. And I think part of the issue is we could be our biggest critic. And so when people are experiencing something, they'll go on Google and they'll diagnose themselves with a thousand different things and that okay. will drive, them, drive themselves crazy. And so, mm -hmm. you know, being licensed you know, if you have a foot issue, you go to a podiatrist. If you're having a mental health issue, you go to mental health professionals. And so that's something that I take great pride in is being able to collaboratively explore what clients are going through and having a treatment plan, having a game plan, and also an understanding of what's beyond, um, you know, what they're going through. I think that's important. So. Well, and you're also a lot more expansive, I think, than just uh, the mental health field because you're taking sure. that whole not just medical but the spiritual aspect, and you're validating it if, if in fact that's what it is, and and really you have some tools to help people. So, and I think that that your book's going to help people. That's a tool. I yes, you know my my book. You know the reason why I got the book out at this time was um, I wanted people myself included to allow their pain to influence their purpose um yeah absolutely knew, you know and, and i knew no pain, no gain. you know no you say no no pain no gain no pain, no gain. <laughs> like, you know, the late betty right i love that song but uh you know she, unfortunately she passed away a couple months but i i play that song all the time it's a beautiful song but you know the point that i'm trying to do is there's a lot of parallels with what I went through and what I see today in a sense that I had an upper respiratory infection, you know, that affected me to suffocate. Yeah. Um, you know, I lost my breath. I wasn't able to breathe. And so I think that's happening to people, you know, not just physically, yeah. but emotionally, yeah. 
psychologically, yeah. you know, they're yeah. just running out of life, running out of that life force. And wow. I wanted to kind of have yeah. people to kind of be like a solar being where we're kind of almost deprived of the energy in the outside world and finding a way to really fine tune the inner world that they connect to so that they could live from the inside out versus the outside in. You know, I think that's a better recipe for evolution and success. Well, and I think that's happening. And some people are being forced, you know, kicking and screaming, but I think that they're forced to see uh, what's in front of them and what needs to happen. I mean, getting rid of the uh, the things that you don't like is important, but you have to face it first. So I think that we, this is a positive thing. And I think the book's mm -hmm. coming out, you know, at a great time. And you're right. And it's funny, you, uh, the whole respiratory, and one of mine was pneumonia, and it was a big one. And it was, you know, I drowned in my fluids in my lungs. And, uh, but you know, honestly, it was very peaceful. That sounds terrible because people, oh, it sounds awful. It was peaceful, uh, even though that's what was going on. But uh, there, there is so much more to this world than we know it. And we're so much bigger than just these bodies. And sure. I think that's why uh, stories like yours let people know that. And that there is love on the other side. I do want to ask you this. So you, so when you went through the suffocation, you know, obviously you were helped and brought back. What is the biggest thing that you brought back with you that you saw that was, you said euphoric, that you recall? What are the one or two things that you feel that was mm -hmm. euphoric? I would say the first thing to speak to the times, what I learned, what's inside of me is much more than anything that could happen outside of me. You know, the most painful moment in my life was suffocation. I'm sure you could attest to drowning. I think a lot of people bypass some of that, but that to me was the scariest moment of my life. But I was able to look at the greatest fear or the greatest worry or the greatest dark point and look past that and just see all was this euphoric eternal light at the end of the day. And that light wasn't something far out there. The kingdom was within. It was it was right here, you know, within. And so that's something that I take with me and I try to integrate within good moments and within moments when I'm challenged, when I'm kind of off off centered, right. off kiltered, is to remember that. The second thing though is is the amount of support that's around us. I think mm -hmm. right now so many people struggle with feelings of isolation, uh, feeling that we're have to muscle this all on our own. And I think that this is twofold. It helps to really assist in isolation and protection, but it also leads to service and understanding that I learned that this school is very much a training ground to be a higher guide, you know, a spiritual guide or a higher kind of counsel on the other side. And I think part of it is learning how to utilize that and implement it here. And I think the ultimate collateral of this experience is a ripple effect that we have on each other, not just the body, not just the house, not the car. So it's not so much in the egocentric, self-serving lifestyle that we have, but rather how we're able to integrate the me and the we and create a cohesive, supportive, you know, lifetime for, for each other. So. Well, I, well, absolutely. And, you know, there are people that are watching this that, that has that have not had a, a spiritual experience. But if you live long enough, something's going to happen. It may not be a near death experience, but it will be something it could be out of body. I don't know. But if you live long enough, things happen. And at least when they do now, people go, oh, OK, this is what this is what this might be right here. And, and we can see it as part of uh, the fiber of our soul and not something that's uh, spooky or that we don't have a context for. But look, mm -hmm. um, your story, uh, they can read more about it in your book, Life After Breath. You can see the link below uh, yep. as far as Jacob's information and can continue to subscribe to the channel. And hopefully uh, that you will be able to join us uh, for the live chat tomorrow. And then we will uh, ask you some more questions. I'd like to know about um, more in depth about on the regression and how that works and what to expect because you may there are people i get it all the time that need help with that and would like to uncover it i know it was great for me so uh let us know if you can do that and thank you so much for for joining us tonight thank you god bless god bless thank you so much